Astra is once again on the path to build another rocket tank. And if you remember the tank that we built last year, you may notice that this tank looks a lot different. So why is that? This is because this tank is for our new rocket called Karma 2.0, which is planned to launch in October, this time at Yurok successfully. <laughs> So many of the changes that we've made are specifically targeted at making sure that we're actually able to have a launch in the end, while also making some interesting improvements and trying out some new technologies. And some of the things that we tried, you may not have heard of before, so it might be interesting to stick around to see exactly what we're up to. Last year we had three main problems with our flight tank. The first and biggest problem was, well, it was really heavy. We didn't have a lot of tank building experience, and we went through a whole bunch of design iterations that turned out to be kind of unsuccessful. So in the end, we kind of settled on this battleship version of the tank, which was essentially a steel tank, which we then overwrapped with carbon fiber. The next problem that we had with this tank was actually the cross-sectional area. Obviously, if you're trying to build a rocket to fly through an atmosphere, you want to make sure that it's as aerodynamic as possible. Well, it turns out that for our previous version, that off-the-shelf tanks don't really come in the sizes and shapes that we need for rockets. So it kind of made Karma really fat, and she had a very big cross-sectional area. <laughs> That's what she said? Which had a lot of drag and kind of made the design a lot tougher to work with. Finally, probably the most glaring problem that occurred at Yurok was that our tank didn't integrate very well with the rest of the rocket. Because it's a tank which has been overwrapped with carbon fiber, it's difficult to attach structures which then integrate with the rest of the vehicle. After all, you can't drill holes into a tank, you can't put bolts into carbon fiber that has been wrapped around a tank. If you do that, you're gonna end up weakening the tank and Obviously it's a tank, so you can't just be drilling into it or welding onto it. These things are dangerous and difficult to actually make work in reality. This caused us to resort a lot to gluing things to this tank and having that be our integration solution. Obviously this is highly unreliable and uh, questionable as to whether it would have worked or not. So, the new Karma 2.0 tank is going to solve all of these problems. I have a device that will solve all of our problems. Addressing the first problem of mass, we've decided to actually construct various versions of the tank, which uh, slowly increase the amount of mass that we're saving. So first, we decided to, again, have a backup, which was just a steel tank, again, with the same thickness as the old one, just in the shape that we wanted. So we got a company who makes pressure vessels specifically to make the exact tank that we wanted in the dimensions that we wanted. This, we could be pretty positive, was going to work because of course it worked last year, so there's no reason to suggest that it wouldn't work this time. Unfortunately, the mass of this tank is only a couple of kilograms less than the previous one, so not really a huge improvement there. But then for our real intentions, which was to, of course, reduce a lot more mass, we decided let's build an aluminum line tank. Now, welding aluminum is a bit more tricky, so it can be a bit more difficult to try to find solutions for how you're gonna manage to do this. In this case, we decided to start easy. We picked a three millimeter aluminum liner, which is actually quite thick for the job that we're dealing with. But at least this way, we can kind of prove out the idea of how we're going to actually manage to weld this whole thing. And maybe in the future, we can iterate and make an even thinner walled aluminum tank. To construct this aluminum liner, we started basically from scratch. We got an aluminum tube, which was the dimension that we wanted for a tank, and the bulkheads that enclosed that tube, we got machined at an external company. And after doing a little bit of sleuthing through the welding community in Bremen, we managed to find a welder which was comfortable welding our aluminum with some TIG welding. In the end, we decided to make two of these aluminum tanks, just in case, so we have a backup. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively obvious. Those two aluminum tanks, after they've been wound with carbon fiber, actually subtract about 6.5 kilograms from the overall tank mass, which is quite an improvement. Next up is the cross-sectional area problem, and if you looked at the shape of these tanks, you'll notice that they are quite a bit skinnier and longer, and that's specifically meant to address this. The whole Karma 2.0 system this year is actually quite a bit narrower. Last year we had a rocket which is 250 millimeters in diameter, and this time we have squished that down to 170 millimeters. This basically halves our cross-sectional area, which is a big factor in allowing us to reach higher altitudes and also have a more efficient system overall. We also have some clever tricks that we use in order to try to get a more smooth surface on that tank, because again, if you remember from last year, we had a really bumpy, rough looking carbon fiber surface. <laughs> How can I put this delicately? You look like shit. Finally, there was the problem of the integration. 
Of course, a tank is great, but if you can't integrate it into the rest of the rocket, it's kind of useless. So to solve this, we decided to actually plan ahead and design our integration structures before we've actually built the tank. And for this, we designed these fancy looking spars, which are going to be placed onto the metal of the tank, just with silicon or something. And then we're actually going to wind over top of them during the winding process. Using this method actually allows the part that you're winding over to become a part of the tank in general. So it's not going anywhere. The fibers actually tightly hold the spar in place, almost as if that spar was now part of the tank. And we did kind of experiment with this last year because we had a hard point on our old tank, which was basically this bronze circle looking thing. So we basically just designed these spars with that similar methodology. And essentially we can be pretty sure now that those contact points are gonna be rigid and secure. And of course, now that we have those rectangular parts that are now a part of the tank, we can put bolt holes into them, we can thread them, and then we can have them be connectors for the rest of the rocket. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. With all that figured out, the next step was to actually wind over those tanks. Before we even start the winding process, there's actually one little secret that we're actually adding to each of these tanks, which is that we actually want to have a good idea of what the temperature is inside the tank. This is important to figure out what the level of nitrous oxide is within the tank because there's gonna be a barrier between the liquid and the gas that's in there. And the liquid is actually quite cold and the gas is, because it's getting compressed, gets kind of warm. So you can tell where the liquid is just by knowing what the temperature is at each point of the tank. Last year, we connected temperature sensors by just duct taping them to the surface of the tank. And that worked okay, but I feel like there's a little bit of a delay in how quickly you get that temperature data. So it kind of makes your resolution not so nice. But this time we have a maybe more clever solution where we're actually going to put a chain of temperature sensors onto the metal surface itself. And then we're gonna wind over top of it. That way, the temperature sensor is almost directly in contact with the liquid. I mean, through a little bit of a two millimeters of metal, but still, potentially a lot better data could come out of that. We did do a test wind with this idea with just a PVC uh, tank, just to see if it would actually work. And we managed to actually wind it in successfully and actually get data out of the sensors. So we thought, hey, this might actually be a good clever way to figure out what the level in your tank is when you're dealing with nitrous oxide. Clever girl. Now, of course, during the winding process, when you're actually laying up the tank, it may be a little bit difficult to manage winding over those spars. But as long as you have the person that's there to kind of guide the fiber one way or the other way around the spar each time, then it ends up being okay. It's a little bit of a pain in the butt, but in the end, you get a really good result. So in a way, it's probably worth it. One thing that I should mention, though, is that while you're winding tanks like this, you can get a problem with fiber slippage across the surface of the top of the bulkhead. And this will kind of cause all the fiber to bunch up around the spar itself, and then you'll get big gaps in the middles where there isn't any fiber kind of laying down because it keeps slipping away. To solve this, it's a good idea to have kind of a winding catcher at each bulkhead, which basically fixes the fiber di direction at each iteration as you go around the bulkhead and keeps the fibers consistently laying up in a pattern. This wouldn't be so much of a problem if you didn't have spars because you can kind of design the winding code to exactly follow the contour of the bulkhead so it doesn't slip. But with the spars, you have to be a little bit, again, working with the situation and you have to find these clever ways to make the wind work the way you want it to. And these winding catchers are really easy to make. It's literally a 30 minute print on your 3D printer and you just have to attach it with some glue to the tank and then you're ready to go. In this case, we used our trusty friend silicon. So, even though we had a big issue with silicon last year in our tank, there's still a little bit of silicon in our tank this time too. Finally, to get that nice, smooth, beautiful aerodynamic surface, we needed a better way than just winding it up and letting it spin like we did last year. So this time we're going to apply shrink wrap tape. There are a bunch of different ways to get a smooth surface when you're winding carbon fiber, but shrink wrap tape is potentially the easiest one, especially when you have a winding machine available to you, because all you really have to do is just take off the fiber throw on the shrink wrap tape and just run the code again and just have that shrink wrap tape laid right onto the tube. And that's pretty much exactly what we did. Just make sure that you know which side of the shrink wrap tape is the uh, quick release side. Because if you accidentally wind it on the wrong side, the tape doesn't come off. <laughs> yeah, we made that mistake once. But the next question is, do these three tanks actually work? Good question. After all, we did try a lot of new things, so it's a good idea to, of course, do a pressure test before we start using it in our propulsion system. So 
The operating pressure for our nitrous oxide tank is 70 bar, so the target for this test is to prove the tank is good up to 1.5 times the safety factor, which means we need to test to 105 bar. But we're going to test in phases, so we're going to start at 30 bar, then we increase to 60 bar, and the final test is that pressure test all the way to 105 bar. How much pressure is it going to take, Shiraz? At least 300. At least 300. Thank you. Which one? You, you believe it? Aha, Maya Ali. I'm confident it will take 400. 400. Damn, okay. The way that we're doing this pressure testing is similar to last year. We're just using a pressure washer in order to create hydraulic pressure after we've filled the entire tank with water. This makes sure that the test is completely safe. We're not going to have any compressed gas. So in the case that we do have a rupture, it shouldn't be an explosive rupture. After our setup was complete, we were ready to start with the first aluminum tank. Yep. Ah. Off, off, off. It may look a little bit strange with the pressure values oscillating on that first test, but this is effectively what the functionality of our pressure relief valve is. The pressure washer just automatically produces 100 bar of pressure, but obviously if you want to test in increments, you can't just turn on the pressure washer because you'll go straight to 100 bar. So we have this pressure relief valve that's attached to the system, which is set specifically to 30 bar, and it will basically go off anytime the pressure goes above 100 bar. And this allows us to kind of maintain an equilibrium around 30 bar, and that's where you're getting that oscillating activity. We basically use the same strategy, just with the pressure relief valve set to 60 bar for the next test. As you can see, at 60 bar, we didn't get the same oscillating behavior because now the pressure washer was barely keeping up with the pressure being produced. So far, our luck's good. We even held this for a couple of minutes. Finally, to test all the way up to the 100 bar, we simply plugged the location where we had the pressure relief valve. So that's definitely a burst tank. Unfortunately, it looks like the first aluminum tank that we tried did not quite pass the test all the way to 100 bar. You can clearly see that there is a leak at 80 bar and it seems to be coming right from the weld seam on the tank. Upon further inspection, we actually couldn't find the leak on the tank when we went to go investigate. So it seems like it most likely came from the weld seam itself. Once that seam on the inside of the aluminum liner is broken, the water basically will find its way to the surface because the carbon fiber isn't exactly watertight. At this point, we just had to hope that the welding on the next two tanks was a little bit better than the one on this first one. So it looks like we finally reached the limits of our pressure washer and the tank was able to withstand the 100 bar. At this point, the pressure washer just turns off. So you can see the pressure declining a little bit over time. This is just because the connectors that we used into the tank were somewhat leaky. But that's a full success. The steel tank works. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah, we already broke the... Are we getting the records? Yeah! 
Let's go, guys. Oh, yeah. Spot up. At this point, it looks like we have a mostly successful test. Two out of the three tanks that we built were able to get all the way up to the 100 bar of pressure that we were looking for. And on, upon further review, it was actually going up to about 107 bar. That's when the pressure washer was essentially kicking out. Unfortunately, one of the tanks that did fail was one of the aluminum ones. So uh, we only have one aluminum tank left, which is solving our mass budget problem. So hopefully nothing else happens bad to this tank. The next step of the journey for these tanks is headed off to the propulsion test in order to perform propulsion testing in Lampelshausen. And that's coming up real soon, so be sure to stay tuned to see more on that. I hope you enjoyed the video and maybe learned a few things about how to better wind carbon fiber for tanks and structures and things. In addition, maybe you learned a little bit about how to potentially do a pressure test for relatively cheap. To continue learning with Astra, be sure to hit the subscribe button. And remember to expand your horizons.